Uh, good morning, everyone. There's some seats down front if anybody in the back needs a seat. Uh, if you guys want to take a couple of minutes and, and grab a seat up front, uh, there's, there's, there's plenty of room. Okay, all right. Um, so I'll, uh, uh, I'm just going to do a, a, a quick uh, introduction for our three panelists uh, today. Uh, so first we'll hear from Jed Hamilton. Uh, uh, he's the senior Arctic consultant at ExxonMobil Upstream Research, where he helps to find ExxonMobil's research and development. Uh, he's been at Exxon for 34 years in various positions in offshore uh, reservoir and Arctic engineering. Uh, and uh, what he's going to talk about today uh, refers to his recent uh, serving as chair of the technology and operations subgroup on the 2015 National Petroleum Council report on Arctic oil and gas development potential. Okay, to, to, uh, uh, to Jed's right is uh, Paul Johansson. Uh, he's the vice president and regional manager of DNVGL's Maritime Services in the Americas. Uh, he's based here in Houston. Uh, he's been at DNVGL since 1982, uh, joining them at their headquarters in Norway. Uh, he's been with them for uh, 33 years in various management positions all around the world. Uh, and then uh, uh, to, uh, to Paul's right, we have Oyvind Tuntland, uh, a principal engineer at Norway's Petroleum Safety Authority, where he's worked since its establishment in 2004. Uh, he works in the offshore uh, petroleum in offshore petroleum in the Arctic, uh, and uh, he's been he joined the uh, National Petroleum Directorate in '81, where he held various management positions. He's also uh, worked in the oil and gas industry, including as a safety advisor for BP. So, uh, if you'll give uh, all our panelists a warm welcome, uh, and we'll get started. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And uh, good morning to everyone. It's an honor to be able to speak to you today about the uh, National Petroleum Council study that I spent the bigger part of my life between April of 2014 and April of uh, this year working on and completed just about the time the price of oil started to drop. And then I want to thank Fran for the most coherent discussion of the Arctic and the issues that I've ever heard, and that's it was it was quite well done. Um, let's see how that went. Okay, a little about the National Petroleum Council. It's a federally chartered, self-funded advisory committee that was really established during World War II, when the president asked the oil companies to advise on issues of oil production and transportation to sustain the war effort, and then it followed on in an advisory capacity to the federal government, and it now really uh, advises the Secretary of Energy, Moniz. It's not an advocacy group, and it's got a broad and balanced membership, including oil and gas companies and service companies and government think tanks and policy strategy organizations, NGOs, academics. So it's a broad membership. And in uh, late 2013, Secretary Moniz came to the National Petroleum Council with this question that's written here. And it basically was, what research or technology do we need to open up U.S. Uh, Arctic for oil and gas development? But the key word was prudent. And that means striking an appropriate balance between the various dimensions of development from uh, is it protective of the, uh, the native people who live along the Arctic coast? Is it protective of the environment, that it needs to be economically viable, that it contributes to the economic viability of the state of Alaska, and it contributes to the energy uh, viability or the long-term energy security of the United States? And uh, it was because of this rapidly growing interest in the Arctic and this dynamics that Fran described, which prompted him to ask this question. And normally you take about two years for an NPC study to be done. And many people work on it. They're, they're 600 plus pages long. And, uh, but he said, I need this because the U.S. is about to assume chairmanship of the Arctic uh, Council, need it for the quadrennial energy review, 
and I need it for this, uh, to inform this U.S. national strategy for the Arctic region. So instead of taking two years, would you please take nine months? And it doesn't have to be as long. Well, I'm happy to report that we completed the study in nine months, as he requested, but it was still 600 pages long. And so my task today is try to describe to you uh, the basic conclusions from that 600 pages in, uh, in 20 minutes. So this, is the this describes the organization of the study and the scope. Uh, it, it was, the study was chaired by uh, Rex Tillerson of ExxonMobil. And then uh, the real working team was this subcommittee chaired by Carol Lloyd, who's uh, vice president of ExxonMobil Upstream Research, and I work for her. And uh, the study was divided into three subgroups, one that really tackled this issue of prudent development and tried to define what the competing dimensions were and what was an appropriate balance between those. And then there were two in the research and technology area, one in technical and operations, and that was my responsibility, produced the four chapters on the left along the bottom, and, uh, and then one, of course, in Arctic ecology and the human environment. And if you see that statement at the very bottom, in agreement with the secretary, uh, we focused on conventional offshore resource development because in Alaska, the industry certainly thinks that the resource base, how to develop it and produce it is well understood there. The real opportunity lies in offshore and uh, that provides an opportunity as, as Fran mentioned, to, to move more oil down the pipeline and keep TAPS sustainable for the future. So a diverse study team, we had 266 total participants from 105 organizations. The big blue bar is e and companies, um, myself and many colleagues from, from the industry, supported by other members in the uh, service and supply area, many members from the federal government agencies uh, and the Department of Energy, of course, academia. There were Washington, D.C. think tanks and policy strategists, and then Alaska natives as well as representatives from Alaska state government. So quite a few people involved in that. And now I'm gonna tell you what the key findings are that are listed in the 40 page executive summary. And they're told in an order that sort of tells the story for the Arctic. But the first one speaks to the size of the prize. And Fran talked about that. Um, and the second one speaks to the Arctic physical, ecological, and um, human environment, which is generally well understood and mainly through a lot of the research that, as Fran said, was funded by oil and gas industry as we try to do what is necessary to uh, make sure that we're protective of the environment when we work up there. Uh, the third speaks to the history of Arctic oil and gas development. This is not something new. Um, as early as the 30s, there was work nor and onshore north of the Arctic Circle. And, and then when we switched to Arctic offshore, the first offshore platforms to be installed in a dynamic ice environment were in Alaska Cook Inlet in the mid-60s. And the most recent one was installed by Russia in the Pechora Sea, which was the first offshore platform that's not a man-made gravel island installed in the Arctic Ocean offshore production platform. That was another one of the impetuses for the request from Secretary Moniz. Um, the, the fourth one uh, starts to integrate the physical environmental conditions that we have on the Alaskan shelf with the history of development. And, uh, and we'll get into that it speaks to the ability for us to develop these Alaskan offshore resources with conventional existing technology. But technology is not enough. I mean, it has to be economically viable, which is the basis for point number five there. And, and we must have a, the confidence of the public that um, we're able to do this in a prudent way that's protective of, of all the competing uh, demands our dimensions of prudent development. Um, and then finally, 
because oil spill response or dealing with an oil spill in the Arctic is the number one concern of every stakeholder when you start talking about oil and gas development in the Arctic. We devoted a lot of this study to that subject and this finding is that there's been substantial recent technology and regulatory environments to reduce the potential for the consequences of a spill and I'll talk a little bit about that. So the three that I, uh, in this uh, abbreviated presentation, want to cover are number one, four, and seven right there. With regard to the large oil and uh, gas potential, uh, there is quite a bit, and there's quite a bit in Alaska that could contribute significantly to meeting future U.S. and global energy demand. Fran's been through the numbers here. These numbers all come from the USGS Circumarctic Resource Assessment that she talked about. And you frequently hear it's thought that the Arctic contains about a quarter of the remaining undiscovered resources in the world. And that's what this, this pie chart shows here. I'll, I'll call your attention to the black wedge. That is the amount of oil and gas that's been produced north of the Arctic Circle to date. That's 117 billion oil equivalent barrels. So. It's not like production in the Arctic is new. And uh, somewhere in the order of 75 or, th or th three quarters of that is, is uh, reckoned to be offshore, hence the interest in this study on the offshore. And then the other thing I'll point out is the Arctic is, tends towards gas. Of the current 400 plus discoveries, about 80% of those are gas. And that you can be seen in the bars on the chart here where the green is oil and this is all in uh, billions of barrels of uh, oil equivalent and the red is the gas. So the more gas than oil and if you look at uh, the uh, Russia and the U.S. have roughly equivalent estimates of oil potential at about 35 billion barrels. That's even though the U.S. has about 11% of the Arctic shelf and Russia has about 45% of the Arctic shelf. But Russia has a whole lot of gas. And that, you know, you can see from the huge amount of production that's come from the Yamal Peninsula, which feeds gas to all of Europe, is probably the second most prolific gas basin after Qatar. So that's enough on the resource base. Let's talk a little bit about our, our finding, our, our, our message that most of the U.S. Arctic is developable today. This is a fairly complex table, but it boils down to three simple things. There are three physical factors that dictate the type of technology that's needed to develop in the Arctic. One is the type of ice present. Is it multi-year ice? Is it first-year ice? Does it have icebergs embedded in it? The second factor is water depth. If it's less than about 100 meters, depending on the conditions, but somewhere in that area, then you can develop it with a conventional bottom-founded platform that rests on the seafloor, like uh, Shell and Exxon have installed off the coast of Sockland, like Gazprom installed the Pyreslam Noya platform in the Pechora Sea. That's existing technology. Once you get beyond 100 meters, then you need floating technology, and that technology doesn't exist. Uh, and then uh, the third factor is the length of open water season. If you've got an ice-free area for two months or more, then you can drill an exploration well, and you've got enough time to install one of these big platforms. Then you do the, ex the production drilling from the platform the way we do uh, everywhere in the offshore. And I'll just call your attention to the red text on here because this chart shows as you move down it, the uh, more difficult environments. And on the right, it talks about the exploration development technologies. And you can see that there are photos for three of those uh, rows going down because those technologies already exist. Below that is, is, is uh, technology that would have to be developed. The middle column then talks about the various Arctic um, basins or, or, or seas where there's a hydrocarbon potential, as Fran said. There's not one Arctic. Things are different. The U.S. Arctic, the Chukchi, and the Beaufort fall in the second and third rows, and that means that they are amenable to existing technology. Now, Secretary Moniz had asked this question about Northeast Greenland or the Russian Laptev Sea or maybe the deep water 
Canadian Beaufort, the answer would be different. There's a lot of technology development and research needed to do those. But the good news for the U.S. offshore is that you can do it with conventional technology. And then I, uh, I wanted to hit the um, well control and oil spill response subject here. And um, as Fran has pointed out, that there's, there's been a lot of mainly industry-supported research in the last several decades. One of note is the one that uh, Sintef is doing, sponsored out of Sintef in Norway. And all the major oil companies are participants in that. It's about a $21 million program looking at oil spill response uh, in the ocean. But we frame the subject in terms of what we call this bow tie diagram here. And in the center of the bow tie is the loss of containment event. So everything on the left are measures that are used in the prevention of a spill. And really the emphasis is on the prevention side because that is where the most uh, opportunity is to protect the environment. However, no one's going to claim you can be 100% certain that these prevention measures will prevent you from having a loss of containment event. And that's where the technologies come in on the right side. And um, so prevention is the main focus. And then the, uh, we spend a lot of time talking about the recent development of technologies post Macondo spill based on those learnings for rapid, uh, well control, well shut off devices in the event that you've lost control and, and lost the serviceability of the blowout preventer. These would be capping stacks, uh, which the industry has developed and now deploy around the, the world for, for use wherever they're needed, or subsea isolation devices, which are basically pre-installed blowout preventers that go on the seafloor and they're independently actuated and uh, do not require any functionality of the drilling rig to, to help them close the well in the event of a loss of containment. So those are new technologies, so to speak. They've been used on land forever, but for the offshore, these are new technologies that have arisen post Macondo and are very effective in bringing a well, the flow from a well to a halt in a matter of hours or days versus the conventional procedure, which would be to bring in a relief well uh, rig and drill a relief well, which would take you know, 30 days possibly or, or more to stem the flow from a well. Now, so that was a basic summary of the findings. If we look at the recommendations here, uh, while it was maybe a little anticlimactic that we conclude there's not a bunch of huge technology advancements that are needed to develop the U.S. Arctic, there certainly are research opportunities, and technology will continue to advance incrementally. Um, but those technologies are needed to, uh, I mean, that research would be needed to validate a lot of the, and do field demonstrations of the recently developed technology for use in the U.S. offshore, and then to pursue, pursue technology extensions that could lead to even improved safety, environmental, and cost performance. All in all, if you read the 40-page executive summary, there's about 32 uh, recommendations, and they, they fall in the categories of research, regulatory, and leadership and policy. And then in the report itself, since this was our main question, there are 60 recommendations uh, for technology research to facilitate development in the Arctic. And uh, the recommendations are grouped into three themes, environmental stewardship, economic viability, and government leadership and policy coordination. Under environmental stewardship, um, the NPC recommends, and, and these are a very high level summary, validation of these technologies for improved well control. A lot of the wells in the Arctic are shallow, and using these tools that have primarily been developed for deep water in the shallow water, is a uh, technology development opportunity. And another one we developed, we, we identified was to use the National Lab's unique capability in quantitative risk assessment to compare the various barriers we have 
in a quantitative sense to loss of well control and ultimate spilling of oil from a, from a uh, well to look at the reliability added by these types of devices shown on the right and especially in comparison to the additional reliability you would achieve from a same season relief well. We recommended government agency participation in these big oil spill uh, joint industry research projects. Uh, after uh, Bessie and Boehm were formed out of the MMS, there's been less participation by Bessie because they, they have a mandate to keep at arm's length uh, position relative to the industry. And therefore, they're not, they have not been participating in some of the main joint industry projects where the technology is really being advanced. And since they have that regulatory position, it's important for them to have at least observer status in that. Pre-approval of all oil spill response technologies, depending on the size of the spill and its location, you can burn it, you can use, uh, you can use dispersants or mechanical collection, but that, that depends a lot on the size of the spill and where it is. So we're saying all those ought to be pre-approved in order to achieve the, the best environmental, or the least environmental impact uh, from a spill. And then um, areas where environmental knowledge, when we're talking about the ecology and the human environment, needs to be advanced. There's long-term ecosystem population estimates. Those, those uh, certainly could deserve more work. Understanding of the interactions between oil and gas operations and ice-dependent species. For example, if you have a platform like the Pyreslam Noya one where tankers come to offtake oil there on a, on a weekly or daily basis, then you have to do ice management around that to allow that tanker to stay moored up while it's loading. So you have point locations where you're continuously breaking the ice year round and we need to study the impacts of those kinds of operations on the, on the ice-dependent species. And then finally, collaboration and coordination of the, the numerous ecological and human environment research studies that have been and are planned but don't necessarily get any coordination, especially between the industry and then people like the North Slope Science Initiative and other government groups that are doing a lot of research as well. With regard to economic viability, um, the MPC recommended that policies and regulations, uh, be, the focus of those be ones that are not overly prescriptive to the point that they discourage innovation and the, and the use of technology advances. So uh, a, a, um, a regulatory environment that encourages the adaptation or the adoption of new technologies like these um, well capping devices. That uh, industry, government, and regulators work together to extend the drilling season length. And that's illustrated in the diagram on the lower left. The upper part of that shows the current drilling season length for Alaska. And there's an ice up day in around November the 1st. You have to allow about 39 days for the drilling of a relief well. So you back that off of November 1st. It says somewhere at the end of August, you have to be out of the reservoir uh, in order to not have uh, the operations carry over into the freeze-up season. Now, there are technologies for keeping a floating drilling operation on station using ice management, and, the recommend, and they were used in the 80s. And the recommendation is that we work with the regulators to demonstrate those technologies so that they're available to be used to extend the drilling season from late September on into the October early freeze up time frame. And the reason for that is that an, a, an exploration well takes 60 to 90 days. And if the open water season is less than those 60 days uh, as currently defined, then usually find it's going to take multiple seasons to drill a well. And the significant investment in the infrastructure and the fleet necessary to drill a well uh, just doubles when you have to take two seasons to drill a single exploration well. Then the other point had to do with lease length. And the, I best describe that as in the Gulf of Mexico, you have 10 years, right, from the awarding a lease to getting to the point where you develop it. And that's 120 months wherein you can be out there 
doing shooting seismic, drilling wells, drilling delineation wells. Well, in the Arctic, you may have two or three months a year where you can actually do work. So that 10 years is no longer 120 months, it's 20 to 30 months. And that makes it really difficult to do all the exploration work needed within the time frame to be ready to develop. You lump on top of that for the U.S. a development-based uh, leasing system where you need multiple delineation wells in order to meet the requirements of the lease, then in that 10-year period, you may need six or seven wells. It's just not feasible in an Arctic environment. So that was a quick run through of the summary of the report. Uh, if you go to the NPC website, uh, npc.org, there's a five minute, very nice video overview. There's the executive summary and uh, you can download the full 600 page PDF if you want to. And if that doesn't satisfy your needs, there's another thousand pages of topical papers that we developed as the grist to, to make into the full report. And there's a council webcast where Rex Tillerson presented the study to the full MPC council. Thank you for your attention today. Great. Uh, uh, so that, uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, Jed. Um, so now, uh, at, at the risk of uh, uh, using a pun, we're going to drill down a little deeper uh, into uh, offshore risk management uh, and the license to operate in the Arctic uh, with Paul jo Johansson. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you very much to the organizing committee for having the opportunity to be here today. And Jim, also thanks for the introduction. I think there's one thing that doesn't is not stated in the in the program is that I. I believe I'm born in the Arctic, uh, at least according to the US definition of Arctic. Uh, I'm within the Arctic zone. I'm north of the Arctic Circle. That's where I was born. But I also learned a new expression today from Mr. Paulson. I'm probably coming from the soft Arctic, <laughs> which is different in Norway compared to the Alaskan Ar Arctic. I would like to uh, elaborate a bit on uh, our view, I mean, DNVGL's view on the risk picture in Arctic and also what are the important points to address when it comes to mitigating uh, different risks. But before I'm going there, uh, let me describe. So some um, where we are and, and who we are. Uh, so this is our office in Houston, or I should rather say in Katy, uh, and that's the main office for North and South America. And uh, this is also a chart showing our presence in the US, or in North America, I should say, with the location of our offices and also the 2,200 people we have around this continent. I think also when you look at some of the things we have been involved with in the US Gulf of Mexico in particular is uh, certainly the Macondo accident. We were actually engaged by the US government to do the forensic investigation of the performance of the BOP at the time. And that was a, a huge project for us to be engaged with. And the report is available. It's in the public domain. So if you have interest, uh, I, I believe you can go to the government sites and find it. We are a global organization with about 16,000 people worldwide um, and uh, in quite a few countries. And uh, we are also operating in four main areas. Uh, that's the maritime part. There's the four main pillars we are operating in. The oil and gas is one area. Then something we call energy. But that's not oil and gas energy. It's more on the land-based, the traditional um, power generation, the renewable energy generation, and also the distribution. And then we have something called business assurance. That has to do with uh, looking into companies' management systems. Uh, are they complying with their own policies and procedures or uh, complying with the international standards when it comes to safe operation, delivering quality, and so forth. One interesting point here is that we, we have a separate research and innovation group. And uh, we spend about 5% of our annual revenue uh, on research and uh, innovation per year. That's in the range of 100 million US dollar per year is being spent on research and development. Part of that goes into Arctic development. And um, we have been in this uh, area for 151 years. We were established in 1864. At that time, we established a purpose of the company who said to safeguard life, property, and environment. 
That same purpose has been maintained since 1864. I think that's quite powerful, and it's even more important uh, in the environment we are working today. So we are living in a very increased, uh, complex world, and um, you can imagine that uh, there's a push on low carbon energy. Uh, we also have to reliable and affordable energy. Uh, Short-term cost efficiency is driven in all companies, but at the same time, you need to have a long-term perspective uh, and also have a long-term competitiveness. And also, efficiency and, and fast operation is required, but we still have to work safely. So these are, these are the kind of uh, business we are engaged with, and we are uh, supporting the business to be better prepared for making the right decision is in this complexity. So addressing these many different and complex challenges uh, and dilemmas simultaneously, simultaneously requires a domain competence and a detailed knowledge within a wide range of areas. And um, it's not enough to have uh, the domain competence within many different areas, but you also need to understand the interconnectivity of this. So that's the bigger picture we operate in. And we do deliver classification and certification services advisory services. We also develop standard, standards and recommended practices, have a wide uh, cooperation with the industry in that space. And we also um, qualify new technologies uh, as they are being introduced uh, to the market or to the industry. And expert advice that has to do with the sustainable business performance. But why Arctic? So if you look at this picture, it's uh, one of the first uh, polar exploration vessels that were built in Norway. Today you will find it in the museum in Oslo. We were actually involved in building that ship back in the late uh, 1880s. And we also had to follow that ship on its voyages, not be on board, but make sure that the ship was up to standard as they sailed around the world. So we have been engaged in Arctic from the very beginning also in Norway. So why Arctic? I think what's listed here has been mentioned by uh, my, the previous uh, speakers. I mean, what's happening in the Arctic uh, is becoming more accessible. Uh, tourism, is, tourism is an issue when it comes to Arctic, mineral recovery uh, and export. So I'm not going into the details here, but why are we engaged in Arctic, talking about the NVGL? I think the answer li uh, lies in the harsher environment, the higher cost, the higher public scrutiny, and the higher stakes it, there are to operate in market. And simply put, higher risk. And I think everybody before me has mentioned risk as an issue. There is a high global, a global demand for energy and also natural resources has led to increasing interest in exploration and use of Arctic resources. But Arctic also creates a lot of dilemmas that the business and society must address, and I think that has been expressed very clearly, uh, and it was very interesting to listen to the words being said uh, of the speakers before me. But there needs to be a, a balance between uh, the need for the energy and the business and the protection on the environment and the climate and the local life where the things are happening. There are benefits such as local job creation, at least on those, in those areas where people are living or where they can live. Um, there's a potential for economic growth. Um, has to do with uh, energy security. I think all of this has been mentioned. But the concerns has also, have also been mentioned. Harm to the environment, the climate change, uh, safety of those working in the Arctic, and also the disturbance of the natives, the indigenous people, and also conflicts between countries. And it's also interesting to hear about the cooperation that's going on, which has been going on for some time. So, I will try to address a little bit on the risk for offshore and shipping activities in Arctic. Uh, what are the risks? And what measures do we have to reduce the risk? And what challenges do we have to work on more extensively? So this is a definition of risk. Um, it's a, a combination of probability of the incident and, the con and, and its consequence. Now you can ask the question, has the cat really assessed the risk of crossing that uh, driveway? Think about that. 
if you look at uh, an example here about uh, the risk picture in a normal marine operation, and, and this is a typical example from the ship operation, but you do the same for the offshore type operation, and you have different elements with a different level of risk, and that could be an acceptable risk level in, let's say in this case mentioned North Sea or the worldwide, worldwide trade. And there are certain mitigating actions introduced to keep that risk level. So this is acceptable uh, by, uh, let's say, legal, from a legal perspective and also from a societal perspective. But if you then move into the polar waters, you have to add something on to these different elements. You have to identify what are these additional, uh, let's say, hazards that will increase your risk picture. And there are also other elements coming. And then the question is, what do we do to mitigate that? To maintain a similar level of, let's say, safe operation as you may have in other well-developed areas. And that's a big challenge with Arctic. So I think the hazards have been mentioned, just to uh, let you see that. I think what, from our perspective, the, the biggest uh, hazard, or the, or the yeah, hazard you can say, is related to the sea ice. It has been mentioned, there are different types of, of ice. Um, it's a low temperature, darkness, light, um, and also the icing in itself that you get from marine, what they call marine icing. And then, the, cha the challenge is also to have the right competency to work in Arctic, to operate in Arctic. So this is showing a geographic uh, and a dynamic risk picture, and it's showing the, the ice development, and it shows you the, maybe I can point. Um, this is the sea ice age in 2012, and it was mentioned also that's probably the, the lightest ice we have had for, for many years. But it shows also uh, on the scale here from one year to five years how different the ice is. One-year ice would normally disappear in during the summer period, but then you have a five-year ice here on the western part of, of the Arctic that will not disappear and has completely different um, <coughs> structure and ways of behaving compared to the one on the, where you have the northern sea route going through. And these are the challenges the industry has to deal with. And so, so the mitigating actions uh, or measures uh, required to address this uh, will uh, differ depending on where you are in the Arctic. So the risk picture is different, whether you are on, on the, should I say, the Alaskan Canadian side or whether you are on the uh, Nordic uh, Russian side. And I, I'm not mentioning anything about Antarctica. I think that's been mentioned, but uh, I think uh, we had the penguins and we had the research. And that, that was all, according to Fran. Or was it Paulson saying that? Um, so in, we have actually developed a um, Arctic risk map, which is a dynamic web-based risk map. And this shows you the um, safety and operability index in Arctic. And I think you can figure out the, the land masses here with Greenland, uh, Canada, US, Arctic, and then uh, part of the Norwegian Arctic and, and Russia. And it shows the um, oper operability index in January in, and July. And um, factors that goes in here is certainly low temperatures, the extreme low temperatures in combination with wind. Uh, and, and the ice conditions related to low temperatures. Uh, we have sea ice, we have marine icing, uh, which is seawater coming onto structures and freezing instantly. Um, visibility is an issue covered by this, uh, fog or clear days, um, and uh, also the remoteness uh, of these different locations. So, so this is actually something you can access uh, on the website we have, and you can see, you can set the date and time, and it gives you a picture of the risk level, uh, where red is, of course, the highest risk uh, area uh, for the given time. We have also uh, developed a similar risk map when it comes to the environment. Uh, I don't have any sample here, but it looks at the, um, uh, it's also public available, and it looks at the vulnerability of seabirds, uh, the fish and the sea mammals, and, and how 
say the risk of doing something to the environment depending on season because you have migration of, uh, of the different uh, say life up there that will have impacting the risk on them depending on what we are doing safety is also depending on type of operation and um, i'm not going into details here but you can imagine uh, the different type of operation in arctic uh, gives you also uh, a different uh, safety level you have to consider. Just take an example, looking at the cruise ship up in Arctic with 2,000 or 4,000 passengers. Think about the rescue, the, the search and rescue operation of getting 4,000 people out of Arctic if something happened. Remote areas, and in addition, you can't reach them by helicopter in many areas. I should mention also that we have developed also a uh, helicopter operational map that is uh, uh, interactive, uh, which is related also to distance from bases, but also related to uh, the, the hours you may have fog or daylight or where you complete darkness. So there's also a, a helicopter operational uh, risk map developed for that. So we think there are four main risk shaping factors, um, and this is based on our own research and also on the experience we have gained from Arctic uh, research. It's the operational part, it's the environmental part, it's the infrastructure in Arctic, and it's all human related. And I think that the keyword speaks for themselves. Um, when it comes to the operational, it also has to do with traffic density. Today, we, we cannot say we have a high density of traffic. But yes, as it develops, uh, the density of traffic will, will increase. Uh, on the environmental side, for instance, uh, visibility, I mentioned fog. There could be days where you don't see anything on a clear day, or there could be days where it's all 24 hour sunlight. Then you're on the winter period, you have completely 24 hour darkness. You don't see anything. So, and then you have the temperature part on the environmental side, and also on the uh, infrastructure. We talk, some mention was also, it was said here about emergency evacuation and rescue capabilities, um, communication capabilities, satellite uh, connections. There are limitations today, but it's being developed. What about navigational aids? What do we do, uh, know about uh, the draft or the, the seabed where we, where we sail? It's not 100% clear today. There's a lot of work to be done on that. On the, on the human part, uh, it's again, we need to build on the local experience. And I think that's been mentioned by Fran earlier on. Um, the competence of operating cold climate. Can you imagine somebody trading on a tanker today in, in the warm equatorial climate, if you like, suddenly get a trip across the um, pole? These are people coming from warm countries, working on board. How would they react to below zero, sub-zero temperatures, where they basically go in a short day-to-day -day on board? And then are not used to the climate. They have never seen it. They have never experienced it. So I mentioned uh, the, the season and location differences, just to picture that. Uh, and it varies enormously with the season and the location. For instance, to operate in, in East Greenland in June, is actually more risky than operating in the Barents Sea uh, in January. Um, and this, of course, will also set the precedence uh, on the activities required. I mentioned the sea ice, uh, the icebergs. Uh, ice management has been mentioned here as a part of the offshore operation. Um, and um, we do not have today ice and iceberg data that are sufficient. There is more research to be done on that. Also, when it comes to weather forecast, do we have reliable weather forecast for the Arctic? Uh, for instance, when you have a, a polar low, as it's called, uh, it will increase the probability of failing or disrupting operation. And you will have uh, uh, high winds with very heavy snowfall and reduced visibility. And we know too little about the atmospheric uh, things happening over the polar regions. But it's being worked on, but we need to do more. This is just an example of uh, in Arctic, summer versus winter. 
it's 24 hour sunlight and it is 24 hour darkness, the winter time. Just of interest, uh, this is a tanker that is operating in the Arctic area. And if you look at, look at the uh, front part of this big tanker, it's all ice. Do we need the icing? Well, that's also something that's being worked on, equipment that can work with de-icing. But if you look closer on this tanker, here you see people up front on the tanker trying to find their mooring equipment. They can't find anything. They have to dig their way to find the anchor and mooring equipment. They're using chainsaws to cut away the ice. And this is what they call marine icing. That's just water splashing on, over the front of the, on the bow of the tanker and freezing instantly. Sorry? Is that salt water freezing? That's salt water freezing. Wow. Yes. Here they use sledgehammers to get the ice off because the load of the ice is also affecting the stability and the safety of the operation tremendously. Snow blowers on deck. It's frozen seawater and snow, of course. I don't think they look too happy, these two guys. <laughs> So, so what are the strategies for, for risk mitigation? Um, and these are some uh, broad part. We, we think that you need to work on the competence part. There needs to be a broad collaboration and there needs to be a high level of communication. I think that's been mentioned already uh, and Fran was talking specifically as well as Mr. Paulson about this. Um, it doesn't have to be high risk to operate in the Arctic, but we need to do the right things because there has been ships operating in Arctic for many years, and it has been going OK. Um, but of course, the volume of shipping has been low. Uh, but we have learned a lot, but we need to learn more. And uh, competence building and these uh, collaboration communication are three main elements that will have to be addressed in order to have a license to operate in Arctic. If you look at the competence part, um, so we need to push forward uh, on the competence level. Uh, we need to utilize the local expertise. We can sit here in Houston or in, in the southern part of a country and think we have all the solutions and we know everything about Arctic. I think we don't. Uh, <laughs> I, somebody said yes, or <laughs> did, I, did I feel a nod? Um, I think we all agree on that. We need to use the local experience in this and we need to be out there to, to continue uh, research. We also need to build up that experience step by step, which we have done so far, but we need to take it step by step. I read an article where it was suggested that the Arctic Bonanza is here to come. It's no coming. I don't believe it. I think it would be wrong to say there's an Arctic Bonanza. We have to do this step by step. Otherwise, we, we could move ourselves and the industry into a disaster in Arctic and also, of course, the local uh, um, environment. So research is a key issue when it comes to, um, uh, to the competence building. And there is a lot of research going on. Last year, I was in Toronto uh, participating at the uh, Transatlantic Science Week, which is a cooperation between, I think Fran was there actually, uh, between Canada, US, and Norway. And um, that was very interesting. There's a lot of good things coming out of that, but we need to get it down to tangible things that can be done and taken forward. Um, Collaboration uh, was another point and has been addressed. I'm not going into detail on that. It's been mentioned both, both by Mr. Paulson and Fran. Uh, but cross-sector collaboration between actors, such as uh, the different industries, needs to be strengthened and enhanced. And harmonized regulations between Arctic states. Uh, and the Arctic Council has been mentioned. And the work that's being done there is uh, fantastic. The Polar Code is developed, uh, will come into force. And then you have, uh, we need to, to share uh, the infrastructure investment for the search and rescue capacity, oil speed response development. And as you've seen earlier on today, that's already documents signed for this. And, and the intent is there. And hopefully the intent will also lead further to the right actions. The last point is on communication. Um, understanding what the voices of the public opinions uh, is important for anybody that would like to undertake activities in the Arctic. 
Well, we saw what happened with, with Shell going into Arctic. Have we been good enough to educate the public of what's happening in Arctic, what is possible to do and what is difficult to do and where are the gaps uh, when it comes to safe uh, and risk-free operation? So this is particularly important um, in order for acti uh, activities to earn its social license to operate. Transparent communication uh, and openness is required. Uh, it's also instrumental that we are open on what the status is of the current capabilities when it comes to the technology uh, and the operation, and equally transparent on where are the gaps. What do we need to fix before we go in there? So we have more work to do, and I think that's what uh, has been said already, and, and it's progressing. And I think we can be in the Arctic in a safe way, but we have to do it the right way. And we have to be aware of the hazards you have as an add-on compared to other type of operation and what we need to do to mitigate that. So do we really, do we understand the new challenge? Well, I think these people are southerners. They are not from, from the Arctic area, but uh, thank you for this. Just let me add that if you go to the website, there is an, uh, quite a hefty report uh, showing uh, our what we call uh, Arctic, the new risk frontier. And it can be interesting reading for those who want to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johansson. Um, we know Santa Claus can get in and out of there, so it must be, it must be possible. Um, <clears throat> okay, so next we have Oivind uh, Tuntland, uh, who uh, is going to talk to us about uh, Measures, measures to prevent oil pollution in the Arctic marine environment. Uh, so focusing a bit more on the environmental side. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I felt it was an uh, honor to come to this university. And finally, we are here. Um, I will give actually two presentations. Um, we prepared together with Sigur Rob or Jackson. He is the smart guy. He is home in the office, so they sent me. But I will try to do my best. He is a nice colleague and has spent lots of his time uh, to do work with the Arctic area. So, I um, also say that um, I'm very glad to see some young faces here. I'm 60 years old, and I see there is recruitment is something that we can question, and therefore it was very good today to see some, very few, but some young faces. Very good. And I also say thank you very much uh, to Fram Ulmer for a kind word about Norway. I appreciate that, of course. I will talk about the baseline study that this is this report. Uh, we hope that we can issue the report in the, within the next two weeks. Uh, we, and it will tell you more about the report. And then I will talk about our case study, um, knowledge and management of uncertainty related to risk. Um, but first of all, starting with the baseline study. Uh, you have learned a lot about the uh, Arctic Council earlier today, so I don't repeat that. But there was a meeting in Kiruna, 2013, a ministerial meeting, and they decided to establish a task force to develop an Arctic Council action plan on oil pollution prevention, presented and present the outcome at the next ministerial meeting in 2015. Uh, I must say we like that very much because they were talking about prevention. And um, <clears throat> it's, it, it's something, this is a change. I've done a lot, uh, talked a lot about, uh, should we say, uh, emergency preparedness in all, all manner but very little on prevention. And I think it's very useful to spend a lot of resources on prevention. 
So <clears throat> In 2014, the Arctic Council found, uh, established the Task Force on Arctic Marine Oil Pollution Prevention, the TFOPP. Uh, the PSA participated in that uh, task force. And in 2014, early January 2015, the, um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Norway said that they will allocate some fund to do the study and they pointed at the Petroleum Safety Authority to be responsible, and we contracted Proactima to do the project for us. Yeah, so I will repeat the scope of the work that was to develop an overview of existing and potential technical and operational safety measures, specially designed to prevent oil pollution in the Arctic marine <coughs> environment from offshore petroleum activity. We should, uh, the main focus sh should be on technical and operational safety measures, existing technology, research in process, in progress, and joint industry project. Uh, and we felt that we shouldn't deal with generic technology for the industry. There have been many contributors, con contributors uh, Canada, Finland, Greenland, Iceland, Norway, Russia, and US. It, Italy, uh, the Netherlands, Singapore, and Germany. There have also been many organizations involved, research and development institutions, university operators, oil companies, equipment manufacturers, class societies, authorities. And the main sources for information came from a questionnaire we sent out, and also conference paper. We have a lot of very good project, and one of the uh, important report we look at was the NPC Arctic Research Study that I've been presented today. That was a very important one. The Russian Norwegian Oil and Gas Industry Corporation in the High North. That was an INSOC initiative and also Barnes Barnes have been mentioned earlier today. That's among others. Um, yes. We have a, yeah, you see it was, maybe we have used another definition on Arctic, but we don't deal with that today. Uh, we uh, developed a very simple method, but it, was a, it seems to be a very demanding one. We, we, we think we should have a risk-based approach so we to identify scenarios that may result in release of hydrocarbon and identify measures that will prevent release of hydrocarbons. And then we have to prioritize. We have wide screening and depth information gathering. And then, of course, information structuring and documentation. The scenario are uh, process leak, blowout, riser, pipeline substructure leaks, object on collision course, damage to structure, leaks during loading and offloading. And uh, the measures are grouped to the following teams with ocean, ice management, drilling technology, well integrity and control pipeline and subsea structures, facility design, loading and offloading, communication solutions, and that is not communication between people, but that, but that is uh, technical, the satellite, and how we could actually talk to us, each other in, in, in the Arctic. Uh, human resources and competence management, oil spill detection, new concept for exploration and production. The report are divided in different chapters. Uh, here is highlighted one of them. That seven technological and operational measure to prevent oil production, uh, oil pollution. Sorry, uh, and it was also some appendix that we think could be very interesting to read. Uh, we have highlighted here two of them, the technology implemented in the Arctic areas, 
and catalog overview of measure identified. Uh, maybe it's fair to mention here too, there is a couple of hundreds referenced research study that have been uh, performed earlier or are ongoing. Um, further use of the study, yes. Uh, we are about to hand it over the report to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They again will hand it over the report to the Arctic Council. Uh, the, uh, the Arctic Offshore Regulatory Forum have got a draft. Uh, offshore Regulatory Forum was a forum that was established in this year. And the members there are US, Russia, Sweden, Finland, Canada, Iceland, Greenland, and Norway. That's the same, same nation that are in the Arctic Council. We think that the report will be used by authorities and certainly the petroleum <coughs> industry and research and development institution, university and students and other stakeholders in Arctic petroleum, in our Arctic petroleum activities. We uh, try to get as much as possible, but we know there is a dynamic environment. Uh, we can only take snapshots, and it's challenging to get a complete overview. And there may be measures that we have been missing. We did not receive response for all institutions and companies. And of course, information has been filtered in, in line with the scope of the report. But we are proud of the work that has been performed and the contribution we have received. And the study is a comprehensive reference document as per October 2015. Then we stopped the project. So the next uh, issue I want to talk about is uh, knowledge and management of uncertainty related to risk. This is a case study based on experience from the Norwegian part of the Barents Sea. The um, Norwegian sector of the Barents Sea is relatively <coughs> benign and accessible petroleum exploration province. There are uncertainties that need to be understood in order to manage and reduce risk. The PSA is running a numerous knowledge gathering project to complement industry efforts in order to enable stepping out to new areas. If I can find the point through here. Uh, this, is, was, this was the disputed area that have just been open and it's called the uh, Barnsey Southeast. And on the right hand side, that is the Russian border that we discussed for more than 30 years. We find a solution. So this is open up. And the other area that um, uh, there was an uh, initiative to open up that was uh, around uh, Jan Main, that, uh, but the parliament said no, they didn't want that. And uh, so it, it stretches quite far north. You remember that the Arctic Circle is about here. So we are quite, quite, quite north. So uh, what, what we try to explain here in this slide is really our thinking, how we have developed uh, the North Sea and how we use that experience to move to the, uh, the Barents Sea. Uh, we drilled the first well in the, in the barns in 1980s. And we try to do it step by step. Uh, so far, we have drilled more than 120 wells. There are, there are some resources up there that we want to develop. So far, we have developed, as I said earlier on, this new bit. But in the near future, within months, we hope to start up the, an oil field that's called Goliath. Um, when 
talking about step by step is that we, we, we find gaps, knowledge gaps. So we learn, when we learn from experience, we see there are challenges that we need to look at. So we, then we ask, do we need to do something with the industry standard, or should we do something with regulation, and how should we learn? So that is the circular, how is our thinking. And uh, I must say that uh, the Norwegian government wants activities in the Barnsey, so you're all welcome to work there. It's uh, accessible and open. And we think that operation in the Barnes give valuable experience on Arctic condition before moving to other areas of the Arctic that are much more harsh and demanding. Yeah. Before opening the uh, South Barnes Sea Southeast, uh, the Parliament discussed a white paper, and um, also discussed earlier this <coughs> this process by, by Martin Paulson in in the opening today, but. Uh, the, parliam the Parliament uh, agreed, uh, and uh, the uh, southeast part of the of the of the Bansi was open. But he says that they have some some action to us, and they have some statement. They say it's important that relevant operational uncertainties and risk are well understood, and are tend to prior to uh, exploration and development and work to identify assess, and assess operational uncertainty and risk in the petroleum activities in the Barents Sea must, so these must be implemented. And I point directly at the safety authority that PSA shall initiate, initiate work in partnership with workers, representatives, and the industry. So that's very important for us. We think of three party working together as, as a, so we would like to work together in, in Norway. And by that, we have been charged with our duty to gather knowledge and identify operational uncertainty and risk. Uh, this slide revealed that we have maybe a different uh, definition of risk than, than others. But we think uh, that if we define risk, means the consequences of the activities associated with uncertainty. That will be the definition that will be used in the future. The reason for that is that it's too easy to say that the risk means a combination of probability and consequences. Because we know in the real life it's very complicated. There are unknown, there are known unknowns, unknown unknowns and black swans, as they call it. So, so we, 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 we are about to stick to that definition uh, in the future. I could talk very much about that, but I will leave it to later. Um, there was mentioned a lot of projects uh, before, and we like to repeat that we have done the Barnes 2020, that the NV was uh, very leading, was involved in leading most of the project. We know there is uh, a lot of uh, work going on in ISO, especially in, in TC67. That's about standardization, and that's international work, and that's very, very important. Uh, we know that the Norwegian oil and gas, uh, that um, uh, uh, they have done a very large HSE project in, for the north. We just mentioned the, TF, uh, the baseline study. And we could also mention the um, Russian Norwegian Oil and Gas Industry Corporation in the high north. That's an INSOC initiative. And um, there happened something special uh, during the last year. Um, uh, Arctic is um, it's a priority for, for the government, also for the, therefore also for the PSA. 
So what's happened? It's extraordinary. We have got the fundings, extra fundings from our ministries, and uh, also from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And we have decided decided to look about look upon six areas: that cooperation, drilling facilities, ice and snow, human performance, structural integrity, alternative evacu evacuation and transport. Okay. There is. Uh, what we think is more or less the uh, official ice uh, edge, and uh, and we see that that's 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 also a definition where the ice uh, edge is. <coughs> we'll not go into that later, but it's really what uh, happens south of the ice edge we are concerned about. Uh, we know. <laughs> We know little about the occurrence of ice, burger bits, growlers, smaller pieces, etc., south of the ice edge. No one has really been looking for them in the recent year, and that is a concern for us. And uh, authorities uh, has the duty to, to ask the right question. It's important that we are knowledgeable about condition, hazard, threats, and risk. And it's important that we do not create non-existing problems due to lack of knowledge. So we would like to conclude that knowledge is the basis for an informed decision related to any activity. Knowledge gaps need to be identified and researched. Knowledge can reduce uncertainty and risk. And knowledge is necessary in order to perform safe petroleum activities. Thank you. OK, uh, thanks to all our, our panelists. We've got time for a few questions, if, uh, if anybody's got one. Uh, sir? Uh, yes, uh, since the lectern mentioned policy and the first speaker mentioned the wide variation in lease terms uh, for the high latitude areas, any prospect of using this interruption in the uh, U.S. federal uh, leasing uh, schedule to maybe have uh, government and industry work together to get something more like a, a Norwegian work plus uh, royalty? sort of contract rather than the, the bonus and royalty contract? These turn on. Um, yeah, so there's there are efforts in Canada right now to work with the um, National Petroleum Board to potentially extend the season based on the severity of the ice conditions. Um, I know Shell asked for an extension of their leases in the uh, Chukchi Sea and, and were denied, and I'm not, not certain that there are ongoing discussions about that. What we recommended in the report is that opportunities be identified to, um, to discuss those looking forward to lease terms for the Arctic areas in the future and potentially modeling them uh, after some of the, some of the other countries, Norway and Canada, in specific. Sir, is there a commonality of operating standards in the Arctic? I mean, you go to the Arctic Council; everybody talks if they cooperate well. I mean, is the uh, is the, the standard operating procedures, for example, for for a rig operating in Norway versus, say, Alaska, or uh, uh, you know, navigating through the Arctic? Are the vessels supposed to? meet some minimum operating standards as we go through the various waters? Yeah, maybe I can try to, to respond to that. Um, when it comes to, um, let's say, the shipping part of it and ship operation, you, you have international standards that are valid for global trade of ships, uh, and that's established by IMO. Uh, they have also added now the Polar Code, which is an international standard to be followed if you and when you uh, pass through the Arctic area. But that's, these are obvious that are moving. Uh, when it comes to the offshore operation, and I think I can get support here from 
from the sideline. But um, when it comes to technical aspects of the uh, assets that are operating, uh, there are when again uh, there are international standards for that. There are also standards developed by uh, societies like ourselves. Um, and a lot of that also has to do with, well, the application of standard depends on where you operate in the Arctic. But then when it comes to the operation in itself, uh, it depends also on the national regulation and the continental shelf regulations. Uh, and then suddenly the international standards are not uh, applicable in the same way. And I think I can have some comments from the sideline on, on that part. Yeah, well, I can try. Um, it's. Um, I don't think there will be uh, a complete set of international standards for oil and gas activities in the, in the Arctic. But there is a lot of good work is done by ISO, and we should try to support that as much as we can. But there will be um, some in industry standard that the government will refer to, because the, we actually need different standards operate in the Barents Sea, or, or for instance, in other Arctic area, because the environment is, is, is diff different. So I, I, I can't think in the foreseeable future that we will have the same regulation or same standards, but we can move ahead by working together with international standards. Yeah, and for um, there are ISO 19906 standards for design and operation of offshore platforms in an Arctic environment uh, that replaced a group of standards that existed before then, API, the Canadian standards, and others, and now there's one uniform international ISO standard, and it's been adopted by all the countries, including Russia, and it's about to be supplemented with another set that um, addresses specifically marine operations and ice. So, and, and that one is likewise expected to be uh, approved and adopted by all the countries. So there, in the last decade, there's been a real move towards uh, unifying around an international set of standards for, for design and construction. Were you, were you asking more about uh, uh, sort of current practices or, 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 or sort of? Design standards. Okay, good, all right. Anybody else? Well, look, I, I've got a, uh, a question here, uh, if nobody else is, does. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the Northern Sea Route, uh, and um, you're just sort of getting an idea of how much, uh, uh, you know, how often uh, this will be used and, and uh, going forward, and if, any, you know, if you envision, you know, a, um, you know how much traffic uh, uh, may wind up uh, uh, being diverted uh, uh, north, say, from, you know, Northern Asia to uh, Northern Europe, and whether that's sort of you know, container or would it be, uh, you know, tankers or bulk uh, uh, vessels. Uh, so just maybe a, a brief snapshot of that, if, uh, if any of you could provide. Uh. Yeah, I, I can try on that one. Uh, well, when I um, worked in South Korea, I was talking about the, the Northern Sea Route and, and what are the possibilities of the future. And I was talking about the Arctic and the challenges. And after my presentation, one of the, uh, one of the biggest uh, car transporter lines came up to me and said, well, what you have presented is telling me that I'm never going to trade through the Arctic with my car carriers. But you know, it's, um, um, it also is a question of how long is that um, envelope or, or time that you can operate uh, through that uh, Northeast Passage or the, the Northern Sea Route uh, when it's ice free. And then it depends also on your assets, where they are, whether they are prepared for uh, light ice condition or, or maybe even no ice, but still you have a cold climate as well that's affecting it. So we don't think there will be a huge amount of um, uh, ships trading the northern uh, uh, sea route. Uh, I think it will gradually increase. But uh, you know, today also when you have the the um, energy price at the level as it is, uh, it is probably and, and it's a fact I think to more economically sensible to travel around the southern routes, which has been the tradition, uh, because the risk is uh, lower and the cost of your operation is still lower now with lower uh, oil price. So I think also the oil price development has led to uh, potentially less focus on using the Northern Sea Route. But there's a lot to talk about it, and uh, it's, a, it's a, a, a search and rescue issue. It's a communication issue uh, that needs to be addressed as well.
Hmm. What about through the, the sort of the Alaskan Canada? Uh, uh, is there ever a, uh, you know, uh, is, is, that, is that a little further off into the future? Or, uh, you know, I notice there's some more permanent uh, looking ice up that, in that part of the uh, Well, it's, it's a different ice, type of ice. Uh, you should also be aware that uh, in the uh, Canadian Alaskan uh, um, Arctic, you also have more land ice that is coming off land and going into the sea. So it's a completely different uh, quality of the ice, meaning a much harder ice. And when you hit that ice with the ship, uh, you will have much more uh, impact when it comes to the, the integrity of the ship and the safety of the ship. But um, uh, FedNav is one of the companies that we are dealing a lot with up in Montreal. And they are pioneers and has a long standing experience uh, operating in the Canadian uh, Arctic and are engaged with the mining activity uh, with bulk carriers. Um, there are p parts of the year where they can't uh, operate, um, but they have also done the first, it was last year, I believe, uh, the first uh, cross Arctic route on the northwest side. They used uh, drones uh, moving ahead of the ship uh, to assess the ice condition and uh, use that assessment to decide whether they had to change the route uh, or find the right way through the ice. There was still ice, uh, but it was manageable. And they did that first passage last year. Wow, interesting. Questions? On that northern sea route, I'll just point out that um, Novatec and Total have an, an LNG development uh, on the Yamal Peninsula, and they'll be moving LNG out, and they'll move it through the northern sea route in the summertime, but in the wintertime, they'll still be going to the west. And there's a very interesting recent article written by a Maersk VP where he looks at the, the prospects for Arctic shipping, and in particular, whether or not containerized freight, which has a very tight time win window on delivery, can reliably move the Arctic or not. And, and, and that's, that's a really good reference. Mm, interesting. Yeah. And I think we have to remember that when you look at the Northern Sea Route, which is the northeast side of it, uh, you have a lot of um, mining and other kind of mineral well, you mentioned gas. It's a big development. So there's a lot of trade within that area and out of that area. I think we will see certainly increased trade when it comes to within the area and out of the area, much more than uh, cargo being taken from Europe across to Asia. Mm. Yeah, I, mean, I remember flying to uh, Beijing in uh, this uh, this past summer, and you know I was looking out the window of the plane, and you could see uh, you know coming coming in from uh, uh, you know across uh, uh, Siberia where the Arctic uh, uh, Ocean met uh, land. There was I mean it was it was blue open water, but uh, you could see the ice uh, not far away. So uh, you know you can sort of imagine it could be treacherous uh, at some at some sometimes a year. Any last question, sir? Yeah, I guess I had, first of all, a, bit, a little, little bit of a comment and then, then maybe a question for Fran, if I may, but I was really, you know, appreciative of Jed's comments about uh, the development, the exploration development scenarios, particularly for the OCS wars in Alaska. And in my view, we talk quite a lot about technology and we do indeed have a need for evolving technology in the Arctic with respect to oil and gas exploration and development. But in terms of actual development, a lot of the technology truly is uh, relatively mature and we know how to put platforms out there, we know how to design and operate year-round export vessels. So all of these things are capable now. The biggest challenge really is in the exploration phase. It's hugely expensive. Um, it's no coincidence that a lot of the capability still dates back to the 1980s, both in the North Slope of Alaska, but particularly in the Canadian Beaufort Sea, because at the time there was major tax incentives by the Canadian government at the time remembering it was the era of the Arab oil embargo, etc. So tremendous amount of expertise and technology was a, was a consequence of that incentive. And the, the opposite, it seems to me, is being true now, particularly in Alaska. There are huge impediments to uh, exploration in terms of cost and the regulatory environment. And it's, it's my, this, this shell is an exception perhaps, but a lot of the other major oper operators are actually conspicuous by their absence in Alaska. You see them more in Canadian Beaufort Sea, Greenland, and indeed the Russian Arctic. And uh, so I think what's really required is uh, the incentive to have the uh, uh, investment in new equipment for exploration, both in terms of icebreakers and Arctic class rigs. And that really isn't there at the moment, I would say, within a US environment. Um, <laughs> but my question, sorry about all that. My question really for Fran was that I really uh, was on, you know, the, the, 
the public space it takes up a lot of time in terms of industry and, and actually the NGOs and the competing interests. But my own experience with the indigenous folks in, in Canada is I understand I think their <coughs> points of view quite well in terms of their relationship with subsistence living and a wage economy. But I appreciate your comments about how it how it is in Alaska in particular and the, the attitude of the indigenous peoples to exploration and, and exploitation activities within the oil and gas industry. You're probably not going to be surprised to hear me say that the answer to that question is complicated. Um, first of all, let me say, I've lived in Alaska a long time, but I always have to qualify my comments when I I'm asked a question about what do indigenous people think about X, Y, or Z, because I'm not. I'm not an Alaska native, and with all humility and respect, uh, it is uh, challenging to speak on behalf of a culture that is ancient and that is intimately connected to the place in the way in which Alaska native peoples are, and particularly in the north, where the <coughs> way in which their culture and their lives have evolved so completely connected to ice. And I mean, they really are an ice dependent species as much as the polar bear are in the sense that the large proportion of their diet, which is based on marine mammals, um, assumes that they have as their principal interest doing whatever they can to protect the environment that protects the marine mammals, that protects their culture. So it's all one big piece. Having said that, um, particularly on the North Slope, uh, the area of principal oil and gas development in Alaska, the North Slope, has a number of indigenous communities, Barrow, Point Hope, Kaktovik, et cetera, that have become quite dependent upon oil revenues just like the rest of the state. So many of the community buildings, the schools, the infrastructure, the gas supply, et cetera, um, that exist today did not exist 40 years ago, did not exist 100 years ago. And so the cultural changes are happening at a time reflecting the availability of uh, what we would describe, I guess, as Western conveniences, water, electricity, roads, et cetera, that are very much a um, feature of the revenue stream that has been provided by oil. So the extent to which the leadership in those communities now have come to appreciate the fact that oil development has become part of their culture in the sense that it provides a lot of the things that are necessary to continue the lifestyle that has evolved post-oil. So the that's why it's complicated, because when you go to one of the villages on the North Slope, you will still see, in a very real way, the culture that has existed for centuries. But you will also see an acknowledgment of the cash-based economy that has evolved, and a desire to have both. Isn't that the human condition that we want it all? That we want the conveniences, we want warm houses, we want to be able to put gasoline in our automobiles so that we can drive around, but we also want to do everything we possibly can to reduce the impact to the environment on clean water and clean air and resource areas that we value for fishing, hunting, hiking, skiing, whatever. And so that same fundamental conflict between wanting it the way it has always been and wanting the benefits that modern society and development bring, you would find when you talk to indigenous people on the North Slope. And that has become even more the case since the United States Congress passed the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, which is very different than the way in which America has dealt with 
uh, Indians in the lower 48. The uh, uh, approach was to provide to the 12 regional corporations lands that cannot be sold, can be developed, and create an obligation to engage in economic development. So the Arctic Slope Regional Corporation, which is the principal large corporation created by the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act by Congress as a settlement of native claims, has an interest in economic development, and they have quite understandably engaged in economic development associated with the oil and gas industry. So Arctic Slope Regional Corporation, reflecting the desire and the obligation under the law to engage in economic activity, does oil field services and a variety of other things, which makes them even more interested in seeing oil development take place. So they have an economic interest in addition to the revenue to be engaged. But at the same time, they don't want to do anything that might interfere with whale migration patterns because they still do whaling as their principal way of keeping their culture alive. And that's maybe a bit of an overstatement, but not by much. So that's why it's complicated. Um, that's why. It is often the case that you will hear the leaders from the North Slope Borough and the Arctic Slope Regional Corporation say that they would much prefer seeing oil development in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge on land than they would like to see oil development take place 60 miles offshore in the Chukchi because their assessment of the risk engaged in those two different kinds of activities oil development that they want on land, oil development that they're worried about because of the impact on whales. Again, you'll find the whole spectrum of people on this topic, but that's, a, I think, a fair generalization. I could go on and on, and I won't. Um, I, I will simply say that, like many places, Alaska, Texas, maybe Norway, et cetera, what we all have a shared interest in is reducing risk. <coughs> And that's why the work that was done by uh, Norway, I think, is so highly respected, because their approach to regulation uh, is very much on the performance-based side of the equation, as opposed to the prescriptive-based side of the equation. And on that spectrum of regulation from prescriptive to performance, the United States has moved post Macondo more toward the performance. We have looked at and learned from Norway. We have adopted the SEMS regulations, which had been, frankly, fought by industry for years and eventually adopted by the Department of Interior post Macondo. So the SEMS approach and, and a variety of other things that the Department of Interior has implemented and wants to do, not just in the Arctic but everywhere, takes us further on that spectrum toward the performance base, which is all about reducing risk. So whether you are an Inupiat in Barrow or whether you're living in New Orleans in Louisiana, uh, everything we can do to reduce risk and yet it recognize the fact that the world needs energy, um, I think that's where the action is. If, 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 may, I, may I give oh. a... All right, yeah, we'll just keep it quick. We've got lunch waiting for us. Oh, just a short comment, but just to also what Fran said. We, we did a, um, a survey uh, back in 2013, 12 or 13, where we interviewed uh, indigenous people both in Alaska and also in Canada. And we also interviewed uh, people in uh, the, say the, the Scandinavian or the Norwegian uh, part of Arctic. And it's correct what, uh, what Fran is saying. Um, like I said, there's a new generation coming as well, and they want to have uh, the good things that they see uh, the development is giving. But the balance between uh, the environment and the development is very important, specifically in Alaska. But they wanted to have more business from, from uh, oil or mining exploration compared to what the Norwegian uh, population would like to see. They thought, we have everything. We don't need to do anything more up in Arctic. They were more concerned about the environment in that respect and f thought that to do some more development in Arctic for, for Norway was, was not important. And I'll just say, you know, for those of you who like to read, there's a recent book out, it's nonfiction, by a guy named Bob Reese, who's an Arctic expert, and it's called The Oil Man and the Eskimo. And it chronicles Shell's uh, interactions with the... Um, with the Inupiats and, and, the, and the government regulators from the time of the Macondo blowout through about 2012. And he really does a great job of capturing the different perspectives 
Uh, he spent a lot of time in in um, Barrow, and uh, it's re it's really good. It, it it will let you see what the perspectives are from all sides. It's a very balanced written book. Great. Well, let's uh, uh, call it there. Let's give our uh, panelists a, a big round of applause. We can continue these fascinating conversations over, uh, over lunch, uh, which I, I, I expect to be ready. <laughs>